Well, thank you guys for sticking around for the last talk. Um, it's hard to follow up all these positive talks when I'm going to come and talk about problems, but I will say this is my favorite subject. This is my favorite area that I deal with. Um, like Jaden said, my summers are very much consumed with seeing people's lawns, gardens, and I would say 90% of the calls I get deal with trees. And so with that, I would just tell you guys, like, we put a lot of time into trees, right? We put a lot of money into trees, and North Dakota doesn't have enough, right? How many of you guys think that, right? Um, so we are going to go ahead and get started, and these are just a lot of the common problems. This is not all of them. I'm just highlighting a section of a lot of ones that I see year to year for you guys. Okay, just had to skip our um, discrimination. So when it comes to diagnosing tree problems and stuff, what do I need? Like if you guys are coming into the office or you're calling into the office, what do I need in order to like investigate what is actually going on with your tree? A lot of times I have people bring in a leaf or a branch. That can be helpful, um, but typically I'm going to need additional information from you guys. And so like those are the top three things that I ask for. I ask for pictures of the tree. Um, the whole tree, that I can see the whole tree, the affected area, the trunk of the tree, um, and then the trunk like that's going into the ground can provide a lot of additional insight. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, why the trunk going into the ground makes a big difference for me. And then it's also really beneficial as a homeowner if you guys can tell me like, hey, I do see like a crack or I see a wound or there's like oozing of sap coming out. And so like this week alone, I had somebody bring in some conwood leaves, just a bunch of them, dead. Dead doesn't tell me a lot. You got a dead, dead cluster of trees doesn't tell me a lot of what's going on with that tree. So that's usually the additional um, information that I need. And then here's just the questions that I'm always going to ask is like, what are you guys seeing as far as symptoms? How old is the tree? A lot of people don't know, especially if you've bought the place. Um, so I'll ask like, how tall? Anybody really good at estimating height on trees? No, so for me, I'm always like, well, just think about it. Are you, are you seeing it like, where do you compare? How tall are you? How, how many more feet do you think it's above you? So that's a kind of an easier way for people to give me an idea about that. Um, I'll ask when you first notice the problem and then if this tree has had any additional issues. Because um, sometimes people say, hey, I seen this issue last summer and I thought, ah, I'll just see what happens, right? And then it comes back and they don't know exactly what's going on. So this is just kind of general rule of thumb, I would say. And it's kind of hard to see in here, but you can see kind of the lack of foliation over on this side. Um, but unless your tree is like at that 30% or higher, um, your tree, you need to know, it's tough. We live in a tough state, so it can handle a lot of injury, disease, bacteria. And if you ever see a problem, most trees can bounce back from it. So we're just going to get started. This is the most common I see in the spring of the year. So if you guys look, we got spruce trees here that the tips are brown, brown on the ends here. And we also see like the fro um, blackening of the ends and shriveled. So this is frost. Um, when we see this, like anybody know when our last potential date of frost is around here? 15th. Yeah, about May 15th. And so like our deciduous trees, a lot of times or flowering trees, like their blossoms can get bit with frost at the end. There is nothing you can do about that. And I would say this year, probably early spring, big thing that I've seen, winter injury with um, spruce trees. So that would kind of fall under the category of frost. But you need to know like with spruce trees or like pine trees, that winter injury does not have like a set pattern to it. You're going to see the discoloration of the browning of needles. Sometimes they're almost even like a purplish tinge. Um, but it's nothing to worry about as far as like a disease. So this one, this is, this is the time of year that I start seeing this really ramp up. Um, this can occur on any trees. You can see right here the really definite cupping on it. Um, other leaves can curl 
If we see this on our evergreen trees, the needles are gonna be very twisted and it's herbicide drift. Again, there's nothing you can do about this. That tree has absorbed it. Um, you know, mature trees, they're gonna bounce back. Younger trees, you do have to be careful of that. I would say most times I have people who aren't willing to admit that they sprayed their lawn um, or they want to point the finger to their neighbors a lot of times. But the one thing is, is you know, when it comes to spraying chemicals and stuff, you have to have the right conditions. And so to find a day that is not windy, good luck here. Um, days that are like hot, like we had a really hot May for those to be out there spraying, um, inversion can happen. And so it's just really being careful and mindful of the weeds in your lawn and where trees are located next to them. So this is, this is an ash tree that I'm showing right here. This is what is called ash anthracnose. So you can see the, the margins that have brown. They've also curled inward. Um, trees can tolerate anthracnose. And depending on the tree that it's on, like maples can get it hackberries can get it, linden, and we would just say, depending on the tree, it would be like maple anthracnose, ash anthracnose. For this one, you can see like some defoliation happen on your tree, but it would take several years um, consecutively to even think about doing a fungicide on that. Anybody see that on their ash trees before? I'd say a couple years before we, a couple years ago before we got like kind of into the drought, um, when we have like a real cool spring with high humidity, that's when this is gonna thrive and be prevalent. Our next one, again, ash trees. We got enough ash trees, right? Everybody's concerned about emerald ash borer, but there's some other things that they have. And again, nothing that's to be too concerned about, but this is rust. And so you can see it actually has like the orange powder on the leaves and then they actually get like these um, spores that will release the rust as well. And so this is a fungus that's going to alternate between your ash, ash trees and cord grass. And so what I would tell you to do is identify that cord grass and get it eliminated. Um, again, there are fungicides out there, but to warn a fungicide, you have to have a lot. And a lot of times people think that a fungicide is going to be a curative. It's not a curative. It's a preventative. This one's just popping up. Um, I had two weeks ago a Juneberry. This isn't a Juneberry. This is an apple. But I had a Juneberry leaf come in. And so this is what is called cedar apple rust. Um, it alternates between cedars and trees that are in the rose family. So that would include your apple trees, your hawthorns, juniper, um, catoni asters as well. And so what happens, like this is what you'll see on the deciduous leaves, kind of these spots going on. And I actually think it's kind of neat looking on the juniper cedars is they actually get these brown galls. And this one at this point is actually like, pouring the spores out. Um, but before that happens is they just look like a brown ball with like a bunch of darker spots on them. And so again, trees can tolerate this. Um, it's gonna thrive under a really wet and humid type of condition. And what I would tell you first and foremost, don't plant them together. That would be an easy solution. I had a gal in Mandan that, like I said, she brought in a sample of June berries and she said, yeah, for about two miles, there's junipers out in her area. And I said, so you're going to have to be dealing with that as it continues on because you're not going to go eliminate your neighbor's trees and stuff. Um, what you can do, though, is you can prune these out on the junipers so then the spores aren't released and not passing over to um, your apple tree or, like I said, something in the rose family. And the other thing that I would tell you is I see way too many times apple trees that are neglected in the sense of pruning. So make sure that you are pruning during the dormant season, that you are opening up that canopy to allow more airflow and sunlight through it. Um, so this one's gonna be a little harder to see again just with the lighting in here, but this is what is a canker, and a canker is gonna describe the symptoms that we see. And so. On this one, you see the swollen area, looks like a bump. 
it actually has like sap that is oozing out of it. And then right down here, you can see the discoloration. And again, in that area that is swollen. Um, so what this is, is this is a pocket of fungus in your tree. And so where you actually see the canker, you'll start to see dieback because that pocket of fungus stops the flow of nutrients out. And so best thing you can do is just manage it and you would wanna prune it back eight to 10 inches into the healthy wood, okay? I'm gonna talk about fire blight is very similar in this and I have that in a few slides here to talk a little bit more in depth about that one. Galls, anybody have leaves with a bunch of bumps on them? Very, very much so this year. Um, so we see these deciduous trees, maples, ash, a lot of ash have came in with those. A lot of people get very concerned because it's very ugly looking. But this is just really an aesthetic damage and pesticides are not needed. And plus you would have to identify what has caused the gall. So what happens in the springtime is we have like insects and mites that are feeding on the plant tissue or laying eggs and their saliva actually contains a chemical that disrupts the plant's cell growth in these leaves and then it causes these bumps. So I tell people most of the time when they come in about their trees, they're more stressed than their trees are. And with the gall, it, it's like a pimple on your face. It's not attractive, but it's not hurting your face. And, and it, it will hopefully not be there next year. This I would say is the most common thing I see with choke cherries. Anybody have choke cherries? Yes. So black knot, this is this is one thing about choke cherries is like choke cherries aren't going to be a very long lived tree. Um, you will see them most likely get a black knot in their lifetime. I get people calling in and saying it looks like dog turds in my tree. Um, and which it does, it does, right? You got those black swollen areas and stuff. So with this one, again, your management is going to be simply pruning those out. Again, pruning that eight to 10 inches into the healthy wood and then destroying the leaves. On a tree like this, this one obviously doesn't have foliage. You're better off cutting your loss and, and moving on to something new there. Okay, apple maggots. This is probably the number one apple pest in North Dakota. You need to start monitoring now. Now is the perfect time. So what you can do is you can go ahead and you can hang traps in the trees. You can buy apple mega traps. They're like a red sphere. Um, you can also make them. So if you'd like go to Hobby Lobby and buy like a wood sphere and then you paint it really bright red and you can coat it in what is called tangle foot. That's a sticky substance. We hang them in our tree right now, beginning of July. And then if you start to detect the adults, you would want to go ahead and do some sort of um, pesticide spray on that. I have a couple listed, but yes, I would say people have this issue of the dimpling and then you cut them open and you see the nasty little brown tunneling in there. The other big apple one that I see is codling moth. And again, this is one that a little bit earlier, you would probably hang this mid to late June. Um, a trap for the adults and so their traps are a little bit different. You can look them up online but they're kind of like a triangular shape. Um, they contain a pheromone that actually attracts the, female, the males and so it's like a female pheromone that the males go in and they get all excited thinking they're going to mate and guess what, they stick down and then they die an ugly death. <laughs> um, so if you start to detect those you could go ahead and again, you can spray some insecticides after your petal fall and then really follow the label, but most labels are gonna tell you seven to 10 days later, a pyrethrian or like a melathion. And so this is actually what is, if you guys grew up knowing like in your classrooms, like I remember in my elementary classrooms, the little apples with the worm poking out, this is what this is actually modeled after. And so that larvae, that female goes in, um, lays her egg inside there and that larvae eats the seed and then eats its way out and then you see those um, holes with kind of like the frass coming out. It looks like little dust on them. Okay, what's the problem here? Okay, rose, honeysuckle, lilac most commonly affected. This is a good example of lilac. 
powdery mildew. So literally the leaves look like they're coated in powder. Um, it's gonna again thrive under like wet, humid conditions. This one we wanna go ahead and rake up the infected leaves. We wanna prune the branches, you know, in early spring to increase sunlight and airflow within there. But the great thing about lilacs is if you get this, like you can cut them back to the ground and they're just gonna come back even better the next year. Anybody have powdery mildew? Uh, it, it can be on others. I didn't list all of them. It's actually, go ahead. We had last summer on some smaller, like, shoots off of our aspen trees, but the main tree didn't. Yeah, I would believe that on the smaller shoots, for sure. This can happen in the garden, too, like, uh, like peonies and stuff can get this a lot. Um, so, again, it's just really being able to try to get a little more sunlight and airflow to some of those plants. This one is uh, one that I see a lot of times, you know, I preach that you should not use rock mulch against any plant. It's not doing any benefits for your plant. It's harming your plant. People like it. Again, we have a very windy state. And so aesthetically, it looks very nice. I hear people complain of wood chips blowing and stuff and that rock doesn't blow or anything like that. But this is very common um, in our urban settings. And I would even say like if you drive around the Bismarck Mandan area, boulevard trees, you will see this. And so you can see down by the rock here, you start to get this like browning and it, it literally the margins or the edges of the leaves look like they've just been burnt. And so um, what you can do about it is one, you can remove the rock. In some situations, the landscape is so extreme that like you're not going to take that time to do it. I've had some gardeners tell me that like they'll pull the rock around their plants and trees like so many feet and then put wood chips and they have said that's helped because again now the rocks aren't right there in um, radiating heat and if you don't believe me that rock gets hot like Sunday is supposed to be 90 degrees go walk across some rocks see how it feels on your feet um, so the trees don't like that either and so I would just say Try to go organic mulch around your plantings and then avoid planting trees to any type of brick or concrete that's near. Okay, I told you guys I would talk about why, why it matters to me to see the trunk going into the ground. Here is probably one of the biggest problems in North Dakota. Um, it's not your guys' fault, but I would say 90% of our trees are planted too deeply. There's just not enough education on how to correctly plant a tree. And so what happens is this root girdling. And so you can see when you dig back how these roots, um, you look at this spruce tree here, it goes into the ground like a telephone pole going straight in. What we want to see at the soil line, if I'm looking out to a tree, I want to see a root flare. So like the bell bottom pant legs, um, that's how it should look. There's nothing you can really do about this. Um, in some scenarios, like some of these smaller roots, you can go out and actually like cut the root, the root that is girdling, you can cut that out. But like in this case here, I mean, that's so extreme, you're gonna take the tree. So the tree's gonna die one way or another. Um, so what I would tell you is try to plant at the right level. A lot of like apple trees and stuff, you know, are grafted. So look for that graft and make sure that's at like the soil line. But this is a huge problem. And some of the symptoms that you'll start to see if a tree is, have or has the root girdling. So what happens again, similar to that canker, that root is actually choking the tree out. It's, it's wrapping itself out that the nutrients and water aren't going up. And so you'll see dieback on the, on the top of the canopies and like the newer branches, that's where it's at because those are the last parts that receive the water and nutrients. Fall webworm. How many of you guys have had this? August, September. This is what my phone, my phone calls pertain to. And I will tell you, some of you guys are like very vicious with this issue. You guys want to get out the propane torches. I hear people calling in and saying, I cut out the branches. That were that that is not going to survive. Okay, first and foremost, they're not causing that much damage. Yes, they can defoliate branches, they can defoliate some of our trees in the fall time, but think about it. It is fall time. 
you're going to lose those leaves in a month or so anyway. So the fact that they just beat you to it or beat the tree to it, it's okay. What I would tell you is go ahead and break up that webbing. You can do like a really good jet stream of water. If you really want to kill and get vengeance on it, take it, dip it in a soapy bucket of water. If you feel the need to just be like, you know what, this is my territory, this is my yard, go ahead and use an insecticide such as BT or Carborol. Carborol is going to be your contact. So once they hit it, you're going to just watch some things shrivel and die up. BT is going to be a slow acting, so they have to eat it and then it actually disrupts like their stomach and they'll die from the inside. Again, don't be cutting it out. I just actually gave this talk a couple nights ago to some people over in Mandan and the person's like, I just cut it out every single year. And I said, huh, your tree must be getting smaller every year as well then. They can, they can, because they will actually pupate into the soil and over winter. So again, you would want to rake up leaves as well. Good point, Marv. Um, wet wood, I see this a lot in some of our larger trees within like the city and even on boulevards. So you see like this, this discoloration going on. Um, there is no treatment for that. It is going to weaken your wood. Your growth is going to be slowed. Some of our trees have like really narrow, what, it, what we refer to as like crotches. Um, some of them have wider ones where actually like when we get these rains and stuff, water actually sits in there and that can contribute to the problem as well. And so when these trees get really large, you'll start to see like that wood and stuff like it starts to rot, it starts to die. But again, this is inside the wood. You can't, you can't treat it. I have not seen this one yet this year. So you see these little, like little turfs of cotton balls on them. This is what is called cottony scale. Often on a maple or linden, but other woody plants can be affected by this. And so what you can do about this, you could use like some different type of lightweight oils, um, carborol and acephate, or even like a drench of a mitochloroplid would help with this. But a lot of times like scale isn't doing a lot of damage that you don't have to worry about it. I think when this homeowner came in they thought like it was more of like a spider nest and they were concerned about spiders coming out. This next one though is a problem and again it's going to be hard to see but you can see on these pines you have all these little white spots, spruces, white spots. Um, I'm sure Chad would agree with me this year has been just severe for what is called white pine needle scale. See this on evergreens. Most homeowners don't notice it until these scales have re re reproduced to a level of actually seeing kind of that whitish color on the needles. Um, you can use an insecticidal soap or a horticultural oil. The thing about scale that's tough is you have to get them like in their crawler stage. And so like I'm not an entomologist, and so what I tell people who don't know much about it and stuff, typically when our lilacs are blooming, that is when scale's going to be in your crawler sta stage. So you could be using like an insecticidal soap, a horticultural oil. What that does is that suffocates them. Your best management is actually going to be doing a little bit of both, like a systemic um, that you would apply early spring. So if you know it's been a problem year after year, I would go ahead, uh, go ahead and apply a systemic the next spring. These can, like again, consecutively year after year, they can do some feeding that you actually do start to see like needle die back on your trees. So can get out of hand, try to get on it early enough. This one, as you see, like this got brought into my office in a bag. You see these leaves really nicely tight, curled. Sometimes they're so tightly curled you can't see underneath them, but when you open them up, you'll see all this white underneath this. This is aphids. Um, again, they're under there. They're sucking some of the chlorophyll, some of the juices out of the leaves. This damage is gonna be minor. Yes, you're gonna have some unappealing leaves. It's gonna be tightly curled. Um, if it's a younger tree, again, consider using a systemic such as acephate, but in general, if you have a large tree, tell me how you're going to spray a tree and get underneath the leaves. Thank you. <laughs> Probably not going to happen at all. 
So this one, I told you we were going to talk about fire blight. I would tell you guys this is the number one killer of apple trees. It happens in the rose family, so again, your hawthorns, your cotoneasters can be affected, pears can be affected by this. So what I see as a telltale sign is you start to see leaves that brown and dry up. A lot of times like we refer to them as a flagging branch. And so people will call and say, like, it looks like my tree's been like burnt in one area, like the leaves have been burnt. And usually when you go out there or they send additional photos, you'll see what this curling in a downward, which we refer to that as a shepherd's crook. Again, fire blight is inside the wood of the tree. And so here too, again, hard to see, but there's actually that discoloration like I talked about on a canker, like this is black, this is still kind of a lighter brown. Um, and so what you wanna do with fire blight is you manage it. You learn to live with it and manage it. And so what you would wanna do is you prune out these branches that are showing it. You're gonna go ahead and destroy them, prune them back eight to 10 inches. Biggest thing, anytime you're cutting a diseased tree, make sure you are sterilizing those pruners. You can spread that just by making one cut on a healthy or on a diseased branch and then onto a healthy branch. The other thing about fire blight is it can actually spread through like raindrops. And so you definitely want to manage it. You could use a um, copper-based fungicide or even like streptomycin. And I do know Cashman's sells that. So again, fungicide is going to be your preventative, help you from spreading throughout the whole tree. I would just tell you if you have it, like you can maintain the longevity, but most likely you're going to lose this tree eventually. The other huge problem I would say within the last two years that just has been very prevalent um, on our spruce trees is needle cast. We have two types of needle cast. One is called rhizosphera and the other is stigmina. Um, you actually need to get the actual correct diagnosis of which one it is. You do need to send that off to like the NDSU lab. Um, but what we see is, uh, no offense to conservation, but we see these in conservation plantings. Um, you know, we want to plant conservation for not only privacy, but wind protection and stuff like that. As trees get older in like tree rows and shelter belts, they kind of tend to almost weed out the weaker ones within there. But a lot of times you'll start to see this get affected where these bottom branches will die off. You can go in there. Again, if we had the correct lighting, you could see what I'm talking about. So I can like, I can take branches in and if I look under a microscope, I circled this, but your needles have little white white um, like pores on them and when they're infected by needle cast those pores are actually black and so that's kind of a telltale sign first and foremost to prevent this like provide adequate spacing um, within your trees if you do have shelter belts and you're starting to see it consider removing those trees consider thinning out your shelter belt as well um, prune out any dead branches. So again, on those top ones, you would go ahead and prune out those bottom ones. Younger trees, you may consider a fungicide. A fungicide that works for both types is chlorothalonil. Um, that would be good, but it's not realistic for your large trees. Like you can't get an adequate spraying. It is costly to treat for needle cast as well. And so it's another thing you kind of learn to, to live with and how to manage it. Um, this is the last one I'm going to highlight for the evening before I take any questions. I haven't seen this one in a, in a few years or anything like this, but again, you can see this on a choke cherry tree. So it just all these little holes. Um, and this is what is called shot holes. And again, you'll see where there's like discoloration on your branches and everything. It is another type of canker. And with this one, there's no sprays recommended as well. You want to trim out those cankers when there's no rain expected. Okay? So there's my photo credits. And with that, I would take any questions you guys have. Any tree problems? So you have your evergreen or your spruce trees, and it's not, they're not together, but 
here and there. We have them in their diet in the bottom. And it's large ones and it's small ones. And it, so, like, is your question, can they still get needle cast? Is that your question? or? I don't know. It, I mean, no. Every year when it's, it's getting worse, it's further up on the tree. But it's starting it at the bottom. Work. Yes. I would suspect needle cast. Um, I would tell you to contact me at your off, at my office, okay. and we can set up a time to come take a look at them. Okay, I actually this year went out to a place that's kind of up by the north Walmart that she had younger trees that were really spaced out. And actually, when she sh sent in the photos to me, it looked like they had like been tilling around the trees. And so I was concerned that they had been hitting the roots and I went out there and actually like she said they hadn't been tilling like these trees were on a slope and they were younger trees probably probably about my height so they were really young and I took some samples back and I did see the needle cast on them so it can affect young and old it can affect nicely spaced trees as well but it, it is a hard one to to take with what you got Yes. So when they get blast off, does it do any good to take them to the ground so focus them and let them come back or will they just keep getting uh, I've never, I mean, unless you've had the experience, I've never heard of anybody taking them back down to the ground where they'll come back nice. Okay. I'd say take them. Just take them. <laughs> Chalk up your loss. Other questions? If you're in a really wet area, what is, what is the best trees to try to grow? Well, willow's going to do really good. Um, your cottonwoods, I would say Chad probably has a good list for you on some of those. I know we have a publication on, so when we had the flood in 2011, NDSU did put out a publication on like trees that can stand, you know, standing water up to several weeks. Um, but as far as like saturated soils, what would you suggest? Willow, cottonwood? Yeah, Cottonwood? There are, right? You can yeah. Get, you can get male, uh, okay. male cottonwood, or you can get some of those copper varieties that aren't exactly a cottonwood, but they're okay. Yeah. Siouxland, and the other one is uh, like Ro. I, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna get this right, but it's like Roberta or Roberto. What? Thank you. I'm like I, we just talked about it the other day, and I cannot remember. Other questions. If there are no other questions, we just want to thank you guys for coming out for the third series.